welcome again to our uh, ongoing journal club and just want to thank uh, the TBI guys, TBI guys for starting this. Uh, Alexis, Linda, and Ashley from the CL Science Foundation for hosting and putting this together and helping us with all the, uh, the web technical support that we need. Um, if you would like to ask a question, I think uh, most of you will have to use the, either the chat box or the Q&A box, which we'll be monitoring. Um, you can also raise your hand and uh, all those questions will come forward. We won't have the capability of asking questions live uh, unless you're one of the active panelists. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you for getting up. And this is something that hopefully will continue on for at least the near future on Fridays. And with that, I want to uh, introduce both Terrence Kim and Jason Cuellar and Robert Rue, our fellow, to present our first article. Um, it's Artificial Intelligence-Based Hierarchical Clustering of Patients, Types, and Intervention. Robert? All right. Thank you, Dr. Bay, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, my name is Robert Rue. Current spine fault at Cedar Sinai. Um, and Dr. Rhea, you have control of the screen now. Great, thank you. Um, here's the article that I'll be presenting by Chris Ames, published in Spine last year. Some quick background there are several adult spinal deformity classification systems, yet the SRS Schwab classification is the most widely used, um, and it's based on radiographic parameters that correlate with patient reported outcome measures but it doesn't account for important demographic and clinical factors. Artificial intelligence, also known as AI, mimics human cognitive function using highly sophisticated algorithms that can analyze vast amounts of data. And this technology has been applied across basic science and other healthcare fields, but not to spine research specifically. So the purpose of this study was to use AI-based, what they call hierarchical clustering analysis of patient uh, types and surgical interventions of adult spinal deformity patients as a step forward in defining a classification scheme that optimizes overall quality, value, and safety. So for methods, they included patients in two prospective cohorts in the United States and in Europe. Uh, inclusion criteria listed here with two years of follow-up. Patient parameters included demographic data, radiographic parameters, and patient reported outcome measures, including ODI, SRS-22, SF-36, and health so, uh, health surveys, including the uh, physical component and mental component summaries. Surgical parameters included uh, number of prior surgeries, the approach, number of levels fused, use of pelvic fixation, OR time, EBL, length of stay, complications. They also looked at uh, inner body fusion, whether patients received a T-lift or an A-lift, and then types of osteotomies. They did a statistical analysis. Um, building two dendrograms, and they did what's called a cluster analysis of, of both of these dendrograms to find correlations. Then they built this um, surgical efficiency grid um, to evaluate safety of different surgical approaches um, as related to improvement in these patients. So for each N patient cluster by M surgery, they uh, computed normalized two-year improvement and major complication rates. So for the results, this is table one that presents the main descriptive statistics for assessed patient parameters, including demographic, radiographic measures, and patient report outcomes. They had 570 patients in included in the study. Mean age was 56.8, and then 78, over 78% 78 of these were women. Table two here um, summarizes the primary surgical parameters. 41% um, of these patients had a previous history of surgery, mean OR time, EBL, um, listed here, 10 levels fused, length of stay was about nine days, and the most common complication uh, rates are listed here with, with their percentage of incidence. So these are the dendrograms that they build. This is the first one. This is what they call a phylogenic dendrogram, and this is a patient-based dendrogram, and this helped identify three different patient clusters. Uh, in blue, they identified what they call the young coronal, or the young patient with coronal plane deformities, older re revision, or older patients with prior surgery, and then old primary. And then uh, here's a breakdown right, right. of three of, of each cluster's variables, including demographics, radiographic parameters, and patient report outcome measures. And then uh, they built this, whoops. Can we go back one? Um, so they built a, a second um, surgically-based dendrogram 
um, identifying four surgical clusters, um, what they call the three column osteotomy group, the no osteotomy inner body fusion group, the inner body fusion group, and then the Smith Pete osteotomy group. Um, and here in table four, they present um, the averages of each variable group by cluster and all the variables were statistically significantly different across groups. <laughs> Um, the intersection of these two um, dendrograms or the different clusters yielded 12 subgroups and the major complication rates range from 0 to 51.8 percent. A two-year normalized improvement uh, ranged from minus 0.1 percent up to 100.2 percent. Um, and on the left here is figure six which plots the percentage of patient reported outcome improvement at two-year follow-up versus major complication rate shown for each patient reported outcome measure. And then on the right is figure seven, which um, shows change in each portion of paid outcome measure uh, from baseline to follow up that were graphically depicted for each uh, patient cluster. So some discussion points that this paper brings up is that this structure allows comparison of ratio of risk to benefit of surgical interventions over this patient population. So as an example, um, they identified that the old revision cluster group undergoing three column osteotomy faced uh, the highest risk of complications, but they had overall greater improvement in patient report outcome measures. They also discussed that surgical efficiency itself may be in a ratio of complication incidence to patient report outcome um, improvement, um, favoring in that, suggesting that less invasive approaches may uh, um, favor uh, a better risk benefit ratio. And they also suggest continuing to allow advancements in this technology to sift through these hundreds of uh, parameters and data points in these large databases. So hopefully to uh, uh, identify other unrecognized associations. Overall, a good study, the strength of the study being that it's a multi-center study, including patients from the US and Europe, and which improves its generalized ability. It's limited in the number of patients it had. Actually, 570 patients is considered relatively low for doing this sort of um, cluster data analysis for, um, for, this, for this type of um, algorithm. So overall take home points for this is that this technology, what they call the unsupervised AI based hierarchical clustering does provide a novel adult spinal and deformity classification methodology. It identifies data parameters, patterns that may augment preoperative decision-making um, and that pattern identification may facilitate treatment optimization and ultimately yield a more optimal improvement and lower risk. And with that, I'll conclude and take any questions. All right, well, thank you very much, Rob. Hey, um, it's, it's a nice study, but you know, where do we go from here and what's the path to implementation for spine surgeons in general? That's a great question. I think it's a great first step, but ultimately I'd like to see something more practical where you can just simply take a patient, plug in all their data points and tell you that, hey, this is their risk. Um, and this is their, this is their risk for this type of surgery and hopefully guide your decision making. Robert, when you dug in, were there any surprises, any, any groups that, you know, uh, gave you an outcome you didn't expect or was it all kind of what you would have thought anyway? Right. And, and thinking about this, I, I think that that artificial intelligence, as, as, it, as it described, um, mimics human cognitive function. And I felt like that it did just that. And it, it just sort of, and I feel like a lot of times we just have this sort of gestalt and saying that this elderly patient who's frail with all these medical comorbidities undergoing this large operation is high risk, but maybe it might be high reward. And, and I think that that's what this is telling us. So it, it, it no Robert, surprise to me. I, I think that this is just a start, you know, for example, all of us that see patients referred by a family medicine doctor, I often think that if they had artificial intelligence, if the patient would put all the data in before they even see the doctor, they would know that they don't need to get it from our Right. So I think this is a big deal, and I think that it's going to help us in the future. And the, the formerly folks are way ahead of everybody else and every other subspecial that we have in spine. So this is a start, and I think it's exciting. This is a nice uh, light reading um, uh, for Friday morning. I'll tell you that, um, uh, Rob, as you um, 
to dig into the details, uh, you'll note that there's a 0% complication rate for the uh, revision old patients who underwent, um, uh, what is it, number two, no osteotomy, inner body fusion, compared to everything else. Um, if you're going to do an AI study, and it is a start, uh, you need, from the AI studies that I've looked at, you need big, big metadata. Um, and so having, um, you know, so if that pool of patients is not representative or not accurate, then it kind of puts the whole AI system into question um, for drawing conclusions. But um, I, think the, I think the interesting thing is that this AI is really good at just modeling our judgment. And when you have an 80-year-old old patient who's been revised, and, um, but you think can get better, how does AI, and you end up deciding that surgery is necessary, how does AI really kind of work there? Because it's going to just tell you 90% complication rate, 90% failure. But we all have our patients um, uh, that we've operated on that we just believed it would work, and it worked. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, I think the, uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, and this is what I talked to parents about is, is that, you know, there's, there's one other big factor with deformity surgery. It's also, it's basically who the chef is or who the surgeon is. And, um, you know, how does, you know, AI take in those effects? Because I think that effect is probably uh, a major one. You know, so in absence of that, you know, I think it's a little bit difficult because I think, you know, who actually does these major deformity surgeries, these osteotomies right. probably, you know, has a big effect on the outcome as well. This is a, this is a comment. Are, are we at risk of using <laughs> fancy lingo right now, like AI, when in fact what this study is is just a very in-depth retrospective yes. review of the prospect yes. database? Totally. It's not, Absolutely. It's not yeah. really AI in the sense <laughs> that it is, yet we've got it published, and people are now saying, oh, this is the first AI publication, but it really isn't. If, All due if respect I, to Dr. Ames if he's listening, by the way. <laughs> right. I think, I think it shows you that you have to have AI to understand the article, because it was, it was pretty difficult <laughs> to even understand the article. Right. Well, truly, if, if you wanted to do this, it, it would be done prospectively, right? So yeah, you'd have right. an AI algorithm. You would yep. prospectively use that, and you would see whether it worked. This is done opposite way. It, as, as he says, it's a retrospective study. That's it. Yeah. That would make it predictive uh, analytics. Right, right. right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I do yeah, like sure. the fact, though, that, you know, Hopefully with each, you know, the idea is that with each input that slowly gets better and better and better and better. But you always got to pick a time where you think, okay, it's good enough. You know what I'm saying? And when do you really figure that out as we're, you know, changing techniques? So, but I do like the fact that, you know, if, if the idea is, is that we would slowly input more data and gradually this thing would become smarter and smarter and help us make those decisions. I think the idea is great. It's just, you know, how do we practically do this? And and hopefully when this comes about, it will be, you know, something that's open source that everybody can use. It's not going to be proprietary. It's not going right. to be, you know, Vitronics or somebody else's, you know, and it'll be in the public domain. Well, Bay, it, it, it's really like the way robotics started in navigation. It's just in the beginning. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, hey, do you want to? There's a whole bunch of good okay. points. Okay. I all think um, right. let's Pat, um, go to. Okay. Did Pat, no, you want to say something? Yeah, they're all, they're all great points. I think that uh, this is useful information, but w whether it's truly artificial intelligence or just real intelligence, I mean, what you have here in the audience is a bunch of people who have a lot of experience already, and we can look at some of these cases, and we already know these things, but this is really to try and apply it to bid broad populations, just as we said and Rick was saying, is that this will be of value. And, and everybody's made some right contributions here is that this is retrospective, but it's, it is how to look at these things in the future. I mean, it's just, it's, it's the bridge and it's the step, but it, it's, it's real intelligence at this point is what I call it, not artificial, so. All right. Okay, next. Uh, next. All right, so our next article is uh, minimally invasive transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. It's going to uh, look at the fusions rates with graphs uh, and that will be presented by our fellow, Blake Burkett. Hey everyone, yeah, as Dr. Bay said, I'm Blake. I'm one of the fellows at Cedar sinai So, progressing here. Let's see, is it gonna work for me? 
All right. So the title of this article is Analysis of the Fusion Rates um, for uh, Transfer Amino Lumbar Antibody Fusion. What is the optimal bone graft material? So MIS-T LIF has been shown to have similar clinical results and fusion rates compared to traditional open-style T LIF. Uh, it's reported that there's less blood loss, shorter hospital stay, shorter rehab, uh, lower costs, lower complications, and earlier return to activity. Uh, the overall success of the surgery does rely on a solid antibody fusion. And as we're going to discuss here, there's a lot of different grafting options, such as local autograft, iliac crest bone graft, allograft, bone extenders, such as demineralized bone matrix, as well as BMP. So the study really splits it up into five different hypotheses that they try to tackle. And there's two, number one and number four, that are tied together. So patients, they say patients treated with BMP are going to have higher fusion rates compared to those without and that at 12 months and 24 months that those uh, rates will stay the same. They also speculate that just uh, autograft alone will have a lower fusion rate compared to autograft plus other products such as bone extenders, BMP. Um, they speculate that uh, iliac crest bone graft will result in an overall higher fusion rate compared to non-iliac uh, autografts. And then lastly, they show that studies assessing fusion rates using X-ray report higher fusion rates compared to those using CT scans. Oop. Shot there. So just briefly mentioning the uh, materials and methods, it's a meta-analysis of 424 papers. Inclusion criteria were minimally invasive case series for uh, T-lifts, population focused on patients 18 years or older, and it had to mention the type of graph that was included in the study. Uh, it's a non-blinded review by two authors. There's 40 papers from 2005 to 2013 that included 1,500 patients. Um, I'll get into more details on this in a bit, but basically the diff different grafting materials are BMP, autograft, allograft, and bone extenders, such as I mentioned, uh, deep mineralized bone matrix. It's a busy slide that I'll, I'll explain in further slides, but the main take takeaways here are just all the different types of uh, combinations that they had for bone grafting. Uh, the fusion rate, no matter what the type is, is pretty good. The lowest was 91.8% for just using autograft alone, the highest being 99.1 for people getting autograft, bone extender, and BMP. Uh, you can see here that 67.3% of patients got autographed without BMP and 32.6% had BMP included. And then lastly, down here at the bottom, it shows that fusion status was assessed 70% of the time with x-rays and only 30% of the time with CTs. So now going through those five hypotheses, the first one is that patients who get BMP will have a higher fusion rate compared to those treated without BMP. The groups here, A and B, uh, BMP versus non-BMP, you can see here there's a 96.6% fusion rate with BMP as opposed to a 92.5% without. Um, just making sense of this table here, this is a funnel plot that basically shows that there's no type of publication bias in the studies for either of these two groups. There's no... Um, um, skewing on either side of the graph that would show that there's any type of bias. Hypothesis number two show is focusing on autograft alone versus autograft plus other bone materials saying that just autograft by itself will have a lower fusion rate. They showed this here with a 91.8% rate just for autograft only. And then whenever they add in other products, you can see that that percentage of fusion increases to the highest that was reported at 99.1% with autograft, BMP, and a bone extender such as DBM. Hypothesis number three focuses on uh, the iliac uh, bone graft. Uh, they were saying that they would have higher rates of fusion compared to non-iliac autografts. But they show here that, as you can see, between the two groups, the fusion rate is pretty much the same. Hypothesis number four is uh, focusing on going back to number one, that the fusion rates in the groups treated with BMP at 12 months and 24 months will continue to show um, improved outcomes, which you can see here, 98 to 93, and then that stays stable at uh, two years of 98 to 94. However, you can see the p-value here is 0 0.36, showing that there's, um, you can't fully uh, say that there's a difference between the two. The last hypothesis, uh, it was saying that studies assessing fusion rates using x-ray will report higher fusion rates compared to those using CT scans. That's shown here that there's a 94.94% fusion rate whenever x-ray is used versus 90% with CT, which I think we would all expect since CT has a finer detail. So the last few slides here, just going into the discussion. Overall, fusion rates for MIST lift are going to be high regardless of the grafting material that's used. Just using autograft alone was 91%. Um, 
they did show that BMP did lead to a higher percentage of fusion rates. Um, auto, the lowest fusion rate was just using autograft by itself. And then lastly, they showed that iliac crest bone graft didn't show any type of uh, superiority over non-iliac bone grafts. Study limitations. This is a retrospective review. There's no controls. Um, there's no clear correlation between fusion rates and outcome. I didn't really mention the complications. They report between a zero and 35% complication rate. Some authors use pseudoarthrosis as a complication, others didn't. Uh, possible confounders, the biggest are that the number of surgical levels treated as well as the uh, cage number. Some people had bilateral cages inserted as opposed to unilateral. And then lastly, there's no specific protocol regarding post-op imaging. Some people got x-rays, some people got dyna dynamic x-rays to evaluate for any type of motion, or some people got CTs to look for it pseudoarthrosis. And with that, that's all I've got. Great, Blake. Um, I'd love to turn it over to uh, Eli, Barron, and Chris Kong to see if uh, they wanted to make any comments. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Um, I, I got the sense looking through all the um, t papers here that this, I mean, this is so heterogeneous in terms of the input to the meta-analysis. It becomes very difficult to make any meaningful conclusions except that T-lift technique does fuse. Um, if you look at the complications, for example, the Mannion paper, the Villa Vicencio, they're looking at entirely different things. Certain papers are focusing on things like heterotopic <clears throat> ossification. Others are much more proximal in terms of their complications. The other thing that's also been mentioned in the paper is the BMP dosing is um, all over the place. And again, it's so heterogeneous that to comment meaningfully on these different grafting materials is difficult. Yeah, but it's, a, it's an important place to start. I think it starts that conversation in a pathway towards investigating uh, exactly those things. Um, and uh, nicely enough, uh, it was published at least uh, digitally with those comments at the end of the paper. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, the journey with I a think... thousand steps begins with one. Um, the question I guess would really be what would drive that next branch or that next direction like whether it's I think <clears throat> arguably probably BNP dosing would probably be the next direction that would be pursued but is it more cost saving or patient reported outcomes that one would imagine to drive where interest goes next um, can I, I think, uh, it's, well, uh, Roger I'll tell you Hart. what I think about this. Oh, Roger, great. Oh, He's Roger. the author. Roger, what were you thinking? <laughs> Roger's paper. <laughs> yeah. yeah. First of all, you know, thank you very much for, for having me here. And I, I think Blake did a really nice job summarizing this uh, uh, paper that has a lot of problems. And, and the problems, obviously, as, as pointed out, the papers that we have to work with are very heterogeneous. So it's very difficult to read. But let me just explain briefly the background just to kind of so the background was that we published a paper that showed that 50% of all MIS TLIFs are being done with BMP. So that was concerning. So we wanted, the, the purpose was really to figure out, is it really necessary to use BMP for MIS TLIF? And, and what I take out of this paper is that it's not really necessary because you get a really nice fusion rate, which was more than 93% without BMP. It is true that if you, if you use BMP, you get a high, higher fusion rate, but if you don't want to use BMP and just use autograph, you still get a 93% fusion rate. That's for me the main take take home message from the paper. And, and I thought that that was helpful information, but I totally agree that there are, <clears throat> there are flaws and there are difficulties because the input is just so heterogeneous. But that yeah, was, I, the idea was I, very, I, how important is it to use BMP? Yeah, I, th I think when I read this paper, you know, I, I kind of felt what you were going at because you know, when t lift started, I mean, it was a newer technique. And I think t lift kind of took craze when BMP came on board. And so it was kind of like, okay, how do we make this difficult technique, t lift you know, how do we make it work? And so BMP, and we all started using BMP in our t lifts. And I think this paper just reflects that, hey, we've, we've with training and, and with good surgery, we've really gotten pretty good at this operation. That MIS t lift we've actually gotten very good. All our fellows have known, you know, know how to do it. And and, uh, you know, we may not really need BMP now to really make this successful. It's kind of what I took out of it. And I thought it was, you know, well done in that regard. Can I make a comment? But, uh, can you make? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Who is um, 
This is Scott Blumenthal. Good morning. I, I really, pre I really appreciate Roger's comments because, <clears throat> truly, if if that was the 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 gist of the paper to look at at that, I, I appreciate that. Um, the kind of there's some flaws methodologically. I mean, there are actually you know to be considered a meta analysis in a peer reviewed journal. There are guidelines you have to follow, and I didn't see the methodology of following the Prisma guidelines. So how to you know, then it's like 17 steps, and that kind of needs to be included um, in the paper at some point. The other issue is with 70% of the, of the follow-up being just x-ray follow-up, there's papers in the literature that says x-rays are best two-thirds accurate at determining fusion. So I, I'd even question the, the, the fusion uh, outcomes as well. Um, you know, we, we all see a lot of patients that, uh, and then from an experience standpoint, um, I, I don't buy 90 plus percent fusion rates with TILA, with TILAs particularly, and I asked TILAs whether you use BMP or not. Uh, that's, just, that's just not our experience. One comment I want to make, um, and, and, it, and we haven't been talking about it, but it was on the last slide that Blake showed, and that was, it really had, there was no evidence that it had a difference in clinical outcome. And I, you know, I think this is a really important point. I see Pat Johnson there. Pat and I trained with Ed Dawson back in the day. And I remember Ed Dawson, for a period of time, never even got x-rays, except for the first post-op visit to make sure the hardware was in, in the right position. And after that, never got an x-ray on a patient. He said, why? If the patient's feeling well, what difference does it make how much bone you're making? An asymptomatic pseudo, you don't do anything for it only get an x-ray when the patient has it. And, you know, so I think we focus so much on the fusion rate. And at the end of the day, that's not the variable that's most important. And uh, I, you know, when I see a study that shows 90% fusion rates across the board, it really, to me, immediately, I don't care what the p-values are, there really is no difference between the groups. And then you want to think about what is the cost and what's the most cost-effective way of getting the clinical outcome for your patient. Agree. I, I, Good point, I think Jens wanted to know. I mean, what we can address it to Roger. Roger. Jens wanted to know: Do you see any difference in design, cage design, or materials, or anything like that? No, we, we, we 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 didn't include that, and and that's one of the uh, one of the interesting uh, aspects to certainly look into, especially now with uh, you know the expandable cages, titanium cages. That would be interesting to to consider. What what Vin said is obviously perfectly correct, and and we put that in the paper. But that is true throughout spine surgery, right? I mean, there's no correlation. So what are you going to look at? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and it goes back to, you know, you can't make, you know, what, what Boko Santek said, you can't make chicken soup out of chicken shit. You know, if, if the papers don't report the right outcomes, as a meta-analysis, you know, can't, can't, do, can't be better than the individual papers. So, so you got to, you got to, you know. But <laughs> I, I do have a couple of comments. These are all great. I appreciate it. And good to see you guys. Uh, I do have to commend Roger for putting together a, um, a meta-analysis because, you know, lots of times you see paper that are meta-analysis, and I'm the biggest disbeliever in meta-analysis. In fact, whenever we have a conference, I always have to use the old term, you know, what's a meta-analysis, garbage in and garbage out. But when you can collect 400 papers, I mean, at least you made a heck of an effort at it, okay? And then to what, to what Vin says, and... You know, the comment is to what are the numbers? What do they really mean? But if I show the numbers to some patient in Los Angeles, and I'm sure the same things in New York and every other city, is that if you say, well, the difference between my success rates with or without BMP is 91% versus 99%, you know what the patient's going to say. Give me the BMP. And whether those numbers, if you just adjust them down by 10 points or something, maybe that's a more realistic number. But, you know, I, I give you credit for trying to make something out of this, and that I, I don't think it's, it's maybe there is some chicken soup here, you know. So um, the next article is maintaining range of motion after cervical discectomy does not prevent adjacent segment degeneration and uh, two level cervical disc arthroplasty versus anterior cervical discectomy infusion. A ten year follow up with outcomes from the LP Prestige study. And Lindsay Ross, our fellow, will be presenting, and I will be uh, moderating with Todd Lamb. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lindsay Ross. Thank you, Dr. Bay, for the 
introduction. I am a spine fellow at Cedar sinai Medical Center in the Department of Neurosurgery. So I'm going to go through two articles with you today. So the first one is um, out of the Netherlands and Belgium, published in 2019. It's a retrospective study of two uh, random control trials. It's, just, it's assessing whether cervical total disc prevents adjacent segment degeneration. The primary outcome study were a range of motion adjacent segment disease and the neck disability index. A little bit of background. So there are quite a bit of papers that talk about total disc replacement maintaining range of motion at the index level. And a lot of these are um, IDE trials from ProDisc, MoDC, Kineflex. And then there's a couple of studies that talk about total disc replacement maintaining global range of motion in the cervical spine. And then there's a few um, articles that talk about total disc uh, replacement not really changing the global range of motion and just maybe having it similar to um, our, um, ACDF. So additionally, there are quite a bit of studies that talk about total disc replacement reducing adjacent segment disease. And again, um, you see multiple studies, Kineflex IDE, PCM IDE, there are retrospective studies, there are systematic reviews and meta-analysis that, that talk to this effect. Um, there is one particular study, McDowell et al., that was published in 2019 that claimed that total disc replacement does not truly change the rate of adjacent segment disease. So here, um, this article uh, states that the problems are that, the, that there's conflicting results in the studies and that the methods to assess range of motion and adjacent segment disease are imprecise. They state that there's a high risk of bias in previous studies and that there's a low um, evidence. So for the methods, um, they look to uh, prospective double-blind, one was multi-centered and the other was single-centered random control trials of patients with single level cervical disease um, disc herniation who presented with radiculopathy. They were assigned to one of three groups, either total disc replacement, ACDF, or anterior disc cervical discectomy without a key fusion. So they looked at the range of motion through a flexion extension uh, x-ray, looked at it pre-op one year and two years post-op. Uh, they looked at the global range of motion and the index level range of motion with the customized image analysis tool and stated that for fusion, the range of motion would be less than four degrees. Again, they also looked at adjacent segment disease with the x-rays and particularly looked at the disc height and the anterior osteophyte formation here, table one, talks about how they um, labeled the adjacent segment disease normal to severe. The statistical analysis I've seen here, p-value was less than 0 0.05 to determine if something was significant. So here the, the N was 253 patients. The patients were pretty young, 45. They're a healthy BMI of 26. And the uh, most of the levels uh, operated on were C56 or C67. So the study's results show that uh, the index level range of motion was significantly higher for uh, total disc replacement at one and two year follow-ups. And it also shows that the global range of motion was, was significantly higher for total disc replacement. However, it did show that the ad adjacent segment disease incidence, the severity of the adjacent segment disease and the progression of this adjacent segment disease was similar amongst all three arms. When you look just at the total disc replacement group, there's, they did not see a correlation between the preserved range of motion and the uh, adjacent segment disease, whether the, it's the incidence, the severity, or the progression. In studying range of motion in all study arms, there is no correlation between the preserved range of motion and adjacent segment disease, except when you looked at the mobile segment in the two-year follow-up, they found that patients with mobile segments had more mild adjacent segment disease in comparison to severe adjacent segment disease. With regards to the NDI, they found no correlation between neck disability index and range of motion or adjacent segment disease. So the major conclusions for this study was that adjacent segment disease is not significantly dependent on range of motion at the target level. There's no difference in progression of adjacent segment disease following total disc replacement or ACDF or just anterior discectomy without fusion. Adjacent segment disease is not correlated with neck disability index. And the, the claim from the study is that the rationale for cervical motion preserving devices to reduce accelerated degeneration at the adjacent levels is not confirmed. So there's multiple limitations to this study, but one 
they said this was just a two-year follow-up and really to assess adjacent segment disease you really need a longer term period um, they used flexion extension x-rays to determine range of motion which is quite uh, effort dependent on the patient's part um, using x-ray to determine adjacent segment disease is also highly dependent on the quality of the x-ray and the reader um, and clinical adjacent segment disease may be a better outcome. We kind of talked about that to evaluate rather than just radiologic adjacent segment disease. And um, this could be better assessed with reoperation rates. That was the first study, and I'll, I'll go ahead and just present the next study, and we can have a discussion about both. So this is the two-level cervical disc arthroplasty versus anterior cervical discectomy infusion 10-year outcomes. This was a prospective multi-center FDA IDE randomized control trial, and it assessed the 10-year clinical safety and effectiveness of the two-level uh, prestige compared to um, ACDF for degenerative cervical spine disease. The primary outcome was overall success, and that was determined by non-inferiority or superiority. So a little background, 2014, the prestige LP cervical disc was approved by the FDA for a single level degenerative mm. disease with radiculopathy or myelopathy. In 2006, they started the IDE trial for the prestige for two levels and compared it to ACDF. The primary outcomes at 24 months was overall success and the total disc replacement was 81% overall success versus the ACDF was only 69.4%. In 2016, FDA approved the two-level uh, prestige disc for DDD for patients with radiculopathy or myelopathy. And in 2017, they published the post-approval study uh, with seven-year results. And the total disc replacement continued to show non-inferiority compared to ACDF and superiority in overall success as well as other measures. So this particular study is a 10-year follow-up data for, the, for that study. So these are patients that were had surgeries in 2006 through 2007. There was 397 patients. Um, 209 had the prestige versus um, 188 had a Medtronic's ACDF. The mean age was 47, half of females and predominantly Caucasian. The demographics and medical comorbidities were similar. And most patients presented with radiculopathy. Again, the treatment levels were most likely C5, C5 6 and C6, 7. And they had a very good follow-up rate, about 80%. So again, the primary outcome was overall success, and this was a composite score uh, that included neck disability index improvement of greater than or equal to 15 points, no worsening of neurological status, no serious implant or surgical adverse event, and uh, the presence of secondary surgery. The secondary outcomes were neck and arm pain, the SF36 physical and mental component, um, so, um, component systems or scores, and uh, they looked at the radiographic assessments, including the disc height, heterotopic ossification, implant condition. They looked at patient satisfaction and patient global perceived effect and physician's perception of results and, um, of course, adverse events. Here, so the statistical analysis, they first looked and, and saw if the patients, if, if the factors had non-inferiority, and then they determined whether they had superiority. Um, what's important to note is the criteria for non-inferiority and superiority is the posterior probability of at least 95%. So when you look at the results, the overall success rate um, was superior for the total disc replacements uh, from the years 2 through 10. Um, and all these uh, posterior probabilities were greater than 95%. Um, you could see the total disc was 80% versus the ACDF was 62%. With regards to the neck disability index, um, this, this was statistically superior for the total disc, as well as the neurological success at 10 years was, uh, was superior. Both groups showed improvement in the neck disability index, neck pain, arm pain, and SF36, but it was the total disc replacement that showed superiority for neck disability index and neck pain score. You can see here with these graphs. So the disc heights were determined via functional spinal unit, and they were maintained for both groups. So with regards to the total disc group, the angular range of motion at the superior and inferior levels was maintained over 10 years. And with regards to the fusion patients, they had a fairly good fusion rate at 95% for the superior and 97% for the inferior levels. So with regards to the patient and doctor perception and patient satisfaction, both groups showed that they were equally um, happy with the surgery that they selected, uh, that they were placed in. And with regards to the adverse events, 
the total disc uh, replacement group had lower rates of implant-related adverse events. Here you can see 8.1% versus 3.8% for the total disc, and these are some of the um, adverse events listed here. Additionally, with regards to secondary surgeries, total disc replacement was shown to have fewer um, surgeries at the index level, so 17% versus 4.7%, as well as at adjacent level, 17.9% versus 9%. When you look here at this elective removal, one thing to note is they had nine patients that had elective removal in the ACDF group, and they described that as patients who had surgery to adjacent, seg adjacent levels but not at the index level where they remove the plate and put the plate on, but didn't manipulate the index level. When you remove those nine patients, the secondary surgeries at the index level were still statistically significantly different between the groups in favor of the total disc. Let me show the Kaplan-Meier curve that shows consistently lower rate of secondary surgeries for adjacent levels in the total disc group over time. So um, when you're looking at heterotopic ossification in the total disc replacement group, there's really no adverse events, but they looked at the rate of heterotopic ossification at the superior and inferior treatment levels, and they showed that they really didn't change over time. So from five years, seven years, and 10 years, it's fairly similar. And again, when, when there's, there's also no statistically significant difference in overall success rates if you broke the heterotopic ossification groups down into subgroups. So the conclusions are prestige LP cervical disc implanted at two levels shows non-inferiority to ACDF at two levels for symptomatic cervical degenerative disc disease on all effective outcomes. And it actually has statistically superior superiority over ACDF for overall success, lower rates of secondary surgeries and lower rates of serious adverse events. So this two level ADR is a safe and effective alternative to fusion for patients with degenerative disc disease and intractable radiculopathy and or myelopathy. Thank you. Nice job, Lindsay. Good yeah. job, Thank you, Tommy. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Lindsay. Who's that, Rick? Uh, yeah, it's uh, Rick Sasso. So, Lindsay, that was really good. The first paper, though, it's really important to differentiate between adjacent segment disease. We, you, you were talking about disease. You said disease a lot. But really, this paper is about adjacent segment degeneration, which is a radiographic finding, right? Disease, adjacent segment disease is symptomatic adjacent level pathology. Degeneration is simply a radiographic finding. And we've had all sorts of problems um, determining adjacent segment degeneration. How do we do that? So in the US FDA IDE trials, it was based on an old classification system called the Kelgren classification system, which is about 70 years old and made for knee arthritis. What they used here is Goffin's uh, classification system, which is simply the same thing. It, they, it looks at two things, disc height loss, and it's fairly subjective because is it 25%, 50%, more than 50%? It's not very accurate and specific. And the second thing they look at is anterior osteophytes. The big problem with our FDA IDE trials is that the control was an allograft and a plate. And what happens when you put a plate on the front of the cervical spine in a lot of instances? Adjacent level ossification of the disc, which really isn't adjacent level degeneration, but it throws out huge osteophytes. And we're, you, when you're using this degeneration scale, Pelgrin or Goff, <coughs> Goffins, you will classify ALOD as horrible degeneration. And that's the problem that we have with our database in our ID trials. Now, what's interesting in this study is the vast majority of their plate patients, I don't think any of them, had plates put on. They, they were interbody cages, standalone cages, so they don't have ALOD. No, I, I that's think, why I think I... they showed no difference. Yes, and well, I, I think in our data, if we take away ALOD from what we're looking at in our FDA IDE trials, there probably won't be a significant degree of adjacent level degeneration between fusion and allograft. And what we've done is, is we've, we have looked at, at our data looking at a better, uh, what, what I think is a better uh, 
way to look at degeneration and that's true disc height loss and and looking at uh, at that over time rather than an old scale Kelgren or golfing I no, think I, I that's think, a really good I think this interesting so I think the first study is very interesting in the fact that <clears throat> they put in a category that's just anterior discectomy without, without fusion. fusion and that group actually fused better than the fusion group yeah. if you look at the range of motion criteria but I do think this is a standard type one area it's like look you know I think the biggest area is, is that it's a two years right yeah. and you know maybe at two years you're not going to see that difference it's one level and so the more levels you have of fusion I think the more difference you may see and uh, what I'd love to see in this paper, though, is reoperation rates. Like, I'd love to know what the reoperation rates were at the index level between the three groups. Because I'm assuming if you do an anterior cervical discectomy and don't do anything, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe your reoperation rate is zero, you know, versus the fusion. You may go back on pseudoarthrosis and a total disc. You may go back because of implant failure. So yeah. you know, I thought those were the interesting things about that. You know, I thought this I'd paper like, was, I was like, did anybody, does anybody do that anymore? Yeah, I know. Um, I'd like to make a, a comment and a question on the, on the papers, and it has to do with bias. And this brings up some really interesting situations. So I had to, to review that first paper for some other journal that didn't get in. Um, and you, if you design a study, you know, randomized prospective, you think that's not biased, and it's not industry sponsored, the European study, it's ostensibly not biased, but you've created a circumstance where there's inherent bias. Lindsay already pointed out, only two year follow up. Anter cervical discectomy, an operation that really no one does, and then counting a few in their fusion group, which they just put a cage, sometimes not even anything in a peak cage, and allow it to move four millimeters and still call it a fusion, you basically have three moving, moving, you know, motion preserving operations or fusions are not really fusions. And their follow up in the anterior cervical discectomy alone group was only like 30%. So the question I want to ask, and I mean, any Lindsay cancer or if Todd Landman's on, on the second one, that's, that would be criticized for having industry sponsorship. So it's inherently biased by the erudite acquisitions. Show me any bias on that second study. I, I can't find any bias in the study design. The, the radiographic parameters are all, you know, not surgeon determined outside core labs. They're all patient reported outcomes. The only bias I see in the, in the prestige study is that the surgeons are handpicked and they're very, very good surgeons, but that would, that would encompass both the control uh, and the ADR group. So my question is, I, I don't get how they can call that bias just because it's industry sponsored. No, I'll point out a bias in the uh, in the second study. This is Yanbei using a posterior probability score, which I, I don't understand. No, I don't <laughs> either. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll get Todd it? Lamin. Who can, who yeah, can well, explain let's it? Todd. We're, we're Todd, Todd was supposed to Todd, 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 Todd was supposed to be here. Is he here? But that, but we'll that was mandated. By, we'll like, no, he's not here. But the posterior probability score. Well, that was that was mandated by the FDA, and and, and it's really a composite that's supposedly more accurate than just using a p-value. That's what the FDA says, and and that was not the study designer's choice. That was the FDA's. Um, no, this is this is the posterior probability score in the yeah. ten-year follow-up. P yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but the FDA uh, wanted that that type of uh, statistics. That's what Todd tells me. I don't know. They didn't ask anybody else to do it though, Jason. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, yeah. yeah I don't None know. of us are, are comfortable with it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where is well, Todd? But, but, but uh, um, my main point, <laughs> so I think, you know, how can we even consider uh, any paper that's studying adjacent segment degeneration when you're only looking at two, at two years, if you look at the, at the 10 year data, the difference really starts to dichotomize around year two or three. And then it's sort of, it, it really spreads further and further out. So, you know, the two-year study really doesn't mean anything. I've seen several papers <laughs> like that. I, I just don't see what it well, means. Well, I, I also think that, you know, just like R what Rick said is, is that, okay, we, we've got this issue with adjacent level disease. We also have the w issue of index level operation with fusions as well as the fact that if you go back at the adjacent level, a lot of times you have to remove a plate or you have to do something and all of a sudden that counts against you in the fusion group because that's an index level operation just by removing the plate. But I like the studies when you start looking at 10 years, you know, forget the adjacent level of the generation, just look at reoperations at the adjacent level. 
Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when you start seeing it 10 years at the reoperation at the adjacent level, so that's really adjacent segment disease that goes on to be symptomatic and you have to reoperate. You know, then you start seeing the statistical significance between the two groups, arthroplasty versus fusion. And typically, you know, when you're looking at two level studies, that group, that differential is even increased. I think, Rick, you had, you, I, I love, you, you had a great study. It's the Brian, when you did the Brian, you did your own 10 year follow up. I love that study. It was single site. I can't remember the, th- the statistics, but you had like, I think four times greater reoperation in your uh, fusion group than your Bryant group. And single site, I thought that that, you know, you followed up, I can't remember, above 85% of your patients. And so I got to commit that. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, I thought that was a fantastic yeah. study. Thanks. Just, a, just a point for the fellows on that first article. You have to get into the weeds a little bit and look at the, at the methods um, because on first blush, looking at that article, it looked like they, they did their statistics and everything was right. But if you look at um, how they evaluated the x-rays, they said a senior guy and a junior guy met for an hour right. for an education session. Well, you know what that means. The senior guy told the junior guy, here's what we're going to do. And then they just measured it off these uh, 24-month x-rays, whereas in uh, the IDE studies, all those uh, x-rays were digitized. They were sent down to medical metrics. They have digital tools. Um, And even though uh, Dr. Sasso disparaged Kelgren Lawrence, the modified Kelgren Lawrence really has very good inter and intra observer reliability. It's for knee arthritis, Jack. I don't know. They got they got pictures of five different levels of cervical (laughs) spondylosis. But anyway, and they had a a three independent radiologists with a referee. So you know the measurements are done um, differently in these in these two studies, including the longer term follow up in all the IDE studies. So the quality of the data is different. That's the point I'm trying to make. You have to dig a little bit in before you trust the the statistics. You have to look at the quality of the garbage that went in. Right. Hey, let's move on to the next one, please. We have 10 minutes. Sounds good. Okay, let's do it. All right. The next article is the cranial sagittal cervical vertical axis. Is it better radiographic measure to predict clinical outcomes? And we'll get that presented by Phil Behrens. Uh, Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Uh, Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Uh, my name is Phil Behrens. I'm a fourth year ortho resident at Cedar sinai and I recently matched into fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis with uh, fellowship director Mike Kelly. Let's see if we can go to the next slide. Congratulations. Um, in adult spinal deformity, the loss of sagittal balance causes compensatory hyperlordosis of the cervical spine, posterior tilt of the head, pelvic retroversion, hip extension, and knee flexion, and ankle dorsiflexion. Uh, so the global comprehensive effects of adult spinal deformity on patient uh, reported outcomes and health related quality of life measures is not entirely clear. Uh, prior studies have shown that positive sagittal balance is associated with increased pain. The C7 SVA is currently the most reliable predictor of clinical health status. Uh, Improving the SVA has been shown to be the strongest predictor of improved outcomes in spine deformity patients. Uh, Another study has shown that increased pelvic tilt is associated with worse uh, outcome scores uh, as measured by the SRS-22. And also the C7 SVA is not uh, significantly correlated with SRS subscores in a different study. Uh, However, the uh, pelvic tilt is a better predictor of function. Um, Thus, optimal total body satchel alignment from the ankle to the head is required to maintain an energy efficient erect position, uh, which could lead to improved patient reported outcomes. Uh, TBSA can be assessed using the cranial uh, sagittal vertical axis, uh, which we'll talk about in the next slide. The authors of the study hypothesized that in spine deformity patients, the CRSVA can better predict outcome measures as compared to the C7 SVA. Uh, 108 patients were examined in this study, uh, 88 <coughs> women and 20 men. These underwent uh, spine deformity correction by a single surgeon at a single center. The imaging was obtained using the EOS device and image analysis was uh, done by a independent senior spine surgeon. Uh, So four radiographic uh, uh, parameters were measured, uh, which include the CRSVA sacrum, uh, CRSVA hip, knee, and ankle, 
Uh, these are obtained by drawing a line from the cranial center of mass plumb line down to the floor. And then the horizontal distance between the radiographic landmarks uh, was used to obtain the values. The other parameters that they looked at in this study were the C7 SVA, lumbar lordosis, pelvic tilt, and pelvic incidence, which were all measured using standard techniques. Uh, the endpoints in the study were patient reported outcome measures, which included ODI and the six SRS subscores. Statistical analysis was used, uh, was obtained using the Pearson correlation, univariate, and multivariate analyses. Um, this table two shows the distribution of the radiographic parameters, uh, as well as the outcome scores. Now, table three lists the Pearson correlation analysis between the radiographic uh, parameters and the health-related quality of life outcome scores. The C7 SVA was shown to correlate with ODI and three SRS subscores, including the total SRS total, SRS pain, and SRS function. But the C7 SVA did not correlate with SRS self-image, satisfaction, or mental health outcome scores. However, all of the CRSVA measures did correlate with ODI and all SRS subscores. The global SVA, uh, as defined by the CRSVA all the way from the center mass of the cranium to the ankle, had a uh, strong correlation with SRS satisfaction relative to the other measures. The univariate analysis also showed similar results. Again, the CRSVA was more predictive of outcomes relative to the C7 SVA, and the global SVA, uh, which is measured from the CRSVA to the ankle, was most predictive of ODI and SRS scores. The multivariate regression analysis showed that the strongest predictor for ODI and all SRS scores was again the CRSVA and not the C7 SVA. The uh, CRSVA ankle is the best pr predictor of SRS satisfaction and mental health as stated. And the authors provide a good case example of their findings. Uh, the patient on the left has both global imbalance as measured by the CRSVA as well as regional imbalance. And this, this patient also has uh, worse health related quality of life outcome scores. The patient on the right does have regional imbalance. However, the global balance um, is much improved as compared to the patient on the left. Uh, and that is reflected in better health related quality of life outcome scores for the patient on the right. Uh, so on to the discussion, um, the authors state that the CRSVA is a better predictor of patient reported outcomes and quality of life measures as compared to the C7 SVA. Uh, the reasons for this could be that the C7 SVA does not consider the cervical spine and it's also limited to the spine column alone. The CRSVA knee had a weaker correlation with outcomes as compared to the CRSVA ankle and hip. And this is because the knee is a more dynamic structure, whereas the pelvis and the ankle are fixed in space. The CRSVA ankle, uh, which is the global uh, sagittal vertical axis measurement, had the strongest correlation with SRS satisfaction and predicts the widest range of outcomes. Uh, however, the CRSVA hip is the strongest predictor of ODI, SRS total, pain, self-image, and function scores. Uh, strengths and weaknesses to the study. Uh, I thought this was a really good study um, and, uh, in, in terms of their statistical analyses. The uh, weaknesses of the study was performed uh, at a single center and the surgeries were done by a single surgeon, but overall I uh, believe it's, it's a very good study to, to weigh on. And then in conclusion, uh, optimizing uh, TBSA as measured by the CRSVA demonstrates the importance of recognizing and addressing the global changes 
that occur in the natural history of adult spinal deformity. The CRSVA also provides a reliable endpoint for deformity correction and surgical planning. Uh, but most importantly, for me, this study highlights the dramatic impact that spine surgeons can make on both the physical and mental well being of our patients. Thank you. Great study. Great uh, presentation. Thanks. Phil, this is Mike um, Kelly. Do you guys mind if I? <laughs> I don't yeah, know. absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, I will tell you that our, our European colleagues would hate this paper. And I think the CSVA and the whatever this cranial thing is, they're not good measures of uh, really anything other than how sort of upright someone stands, right? It doesn't tell you how you get to uh, standing upright. It doesn't tell you anything about the lumbopelvic compensation, which is really what's critical and key for giving people a post-operative state that's comfortable. Uh, so T1 pelvic angle or the global tilt are probably better measures because they, they also include pelvic retroversion. Uh, this cranial thing in C7, they don't tell you about pelvic retroversion. So if you have someone who retroverts their pelvis 40 degrees, right, and their sacral slope's one and their pelvic tilt is 50, that's not a good result. That's a bad result. But they'll have C7 probably sitting on top of their vertical sacrum as like an extreme example, uh, which is why this is not a great measure because it doesn't tell you anything about the actual overall spinal alignment or body alignment. Uh, I would go back, like when these, you know, we get fellows and I have partners that try to write these papers and they tell me that it's very significant, but the correlation coefficients, one, is it, correlation coefficients in general are stupid and we shouldn't be doing them. Uh, two, a correlation coefficient of 0 0.4, no, regardless of what your p-value is, probably shouldn't be published because it's not a strong, it, the, the strength of the correlation is independent of the p-value. The strength of the correlation is the correlation coefficient. And the correlation coefficients you showed us were really low. And then they did these crazy regressions where, I mean, we've, everyone that's on this Zoom has experienced it, where either you have like a really bright med, the bright med students are the worst because they usually come in with these analyses that you're like, whoa, this looks really good. And they do all this fancy stuff in SAS or R or whatever, but your R squared for the regressions is less than 0.1 which means that it's actually telling us very little and it's probably type one error that we got to before. I think Dr. Bay talked about type one error in one of the last studies. So I would say be very cautious with uh, saying that this is a great measure given the, that we know um, that you need to address compensatory mechanisms uh, to get a good result in, in surgery. Michael, I, I, Michael, it's, it's Neil. Neil hey. Mike, thank you for being depreciative on the whole thing and putting it down. And I know it's I know it's from your own institution, but I think you're being too harsh. Because I think what it did, this paper is 2011 and 2012. It's from way back, well before we started talking about this, right? That's one. Two, it brings a very simplistic way of looking at the spine. And we've all done it for years. The head over the hips, patient standing straight, that's what we want to do. It's an easy way to calculate it. So we, the way I look at it is, it's an easy way to look at this, and then you dive into the details that you need to, whether it's pelvic retroversion, PILL, so on and so forth. If your cranial SVA is completely off, you know you got a problem right away. That's what you see clinically, right? To me, this is a good clinical way, radiological way of clinically justifying. What so I, I think what you just said is, is key, but it shows us why it's bad, because you said head over the hips. Right. Right. Exactly. And this That's cranial SVA thing is head over the pelvis. And it doesn't tell us head over the hips. That's like Gupta's thing. When Gupta came, a, 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 a Rusali false type two is high PI, lots of retroversion post op, but they have a low cranial SVA. But at C7 or, or the cranium, whatever, falls near the sacrum, but it's behind the hip joint. True. And in using this and not addressing what you just said, which is the key. Head which is head over the sacrum and hips. So I like the cranial SVAH. What threw me off is how do the cranial SVA ankle, and that's statistics. I think there's something wrong there, that it created such great satisfaction. Because you're absolutely right. If you use ankle, you could bend your knee, lean forward, and still get over the ankle. You right. lost the head over the hip. Mm -hmm. it, it, that what surprised me about this paper, why the cranial over the hip did not come out good. I mean, actually, it came out pretty good, except for a sort of satisfaction. But that's just, just, a, yeah. 
Just as a clarification, this paper was from 17, um, and it's it's highlighting the uh, power of EO. So maybe um, uh, Pat or Patrick Hill or Patrick Johnson, where, where do you think EOS is um, in the state of deformity, and is it useful? Or are they fi trying to find a way to to maximize this uh, low dose imaging uh, modality? Eddie, the patients who studied 2011 and 12. Uh, ah, yeah. it's okay. 2011 and 12. Yeah, I mean, just to you know anyway, take it from like. A, a non-deformity perspective. When I looked at this paper, I kind of it, it kind of reminded me just the concept of global, global sagittal balance. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just not you know totally. more than getting into the details. It was just more than you know C seven SVA that there are other measures the pelvis, the knees, and the ankle to look at global sagittal balance now with EOS. That's kind of you know, and I didn't really get too much in the details. But you know, to me, when I look at this, it says you know, hey, balance is better, right? Global sagittal balance is better, and then it's just you know, how do you really define that balance? And we should be looking at other parameters than just C7 SVA. That's kind of what I took out of the paper. Yeah. I, I, I agree. At this point, guys, the, we, we've known for dozens and dozens of years that the brain sacrifices alignment to maintain balance. That's what we do. We all want to be balanced. And I recall many years ago listening to Art Steffi give a talk about post-op x-rays and surgeries and there's two things you have to remember. Get the top of L4 parallel to the floor, get the pubic symphysis and the anterior superiliac spine in the same coronal plane. So in life, there are lumpers and splitters. The lumpers are gonna get the top of L4 parallel to the floor and the pubic symphysis and ASIS in the same coronal plane. The splitters are gonna create an alphabet soup of all these other things that really become irrelevant in your day-to-day -day activities. <laughs> All right. Well said. <laughs> well said. With that, it's uh, about 7.08. I think that's the end of our journal club. I'm um, um, going to close this meeting and just want to thank all the attendees and presenters. There's one question which we will answer the presenter, so don't, uh, you know, don't be dismayed. Thank you very much. Right. Good hey, job, Cedars. Thank you, guys. Okay, we, guys. So next good. week is uh, Rick hey, Sasso and in the Indiana Spine Group. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Looking guys. forward to that. Yep. Have a good week. Great. Stay Thank safe. you guys all. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Take care. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.